Hi everybody, so I am back for part two of um, I'm not doing very well and we are actually all not doing very well at this time. So um, before I go on, I wanted to really thank you for these really kind comments that you left, right? And you know what's so funny? When I decided to go public with this on YouTube um, about the mom struggles, and the reality behind adoption, David was really against it. Because David said, honey, once you go public, you are placing yourself where people are gonna really attack you. And for me, it doesn't matter because I'm a man and what goes in goes out, okay? But then for you as a woman, what goes in goes straight to your heart and you're gonna be so hurt. So, you know, Clearly, you know, you guys proved him wrong and actually he was really shocked. He was like, wow, I can't believe that, you know, like you are getting so many support from this, right? And, um, you know, I know I've got my Asian genes, okay? But um, I turned 40 last month, no, two months ago. And I think if I was in my 20s, I would never had the courage or you know, the gut to make a video like this, especially, you know, on a public platform. But um, now that I've turned 40, you just kind of get thicker skin, right? Because you go through so much and then um, you don't really care what people say because you've got your own life to live and you're busy, right? So the reason why I make these videos are I'm 40, but there are many, many moms out there who are in their 20s and still very vulnerable to very hurtful comments. And so they're very scared to speak up because a lot of, you know, judgments are going to come their way. And then guess where they're, they're you know, left off at? It's um, in their bedroom, in their closet, all alone, suffering alone. And then guess what happens when mom suffers? It's a child that suffers suffers and so I make these videos especially this last part one and two like some people could be like why is it all about her but it, it is not I'm not trying to get the focus onto myself but I'm trying to encourage other adoptive moms who are considering adoption and then once you are in a similar um, you know time frame after you bring your baby home like us or the current adoptive moms who are struggling all alone and feeling that you're the only one feeling this way, I really want you to know that you're not alone because I have spoken with countless, countless, countless adoptive moms, you know? And I actually joined a lot of adoptive support group, the parent support group for parents, and also, um, you know, we went to adoption seminar and the message that I get across the board is majority of moms are really suffering and most of them alone and they are so lonely and they are just at their lowest point. So, you know, when you, when that becomes um, the norm, it is a child that suffers. So hopefully this video will enlighten a lot of people so that at the end, right, their end result, you don't want the child suffering. By the way, you know, I had several comments where people were like, we want to see Levi, we want to see Levi. Um, I'm sorry, you know, the videos that we upload of our family life, it takes like a long time, almost 30 hours to edit, you know, go through all these videos. So each video episode of our family life is about two weeks worth. And so you have to, we, David has to go through each video that I just took for two weeks here and there and then, on top of that, like he has to edit and then we have to do interviews. So it takes roughly 30 hours by the time he's done. And so those are taking much longer, but you know what? If you want to see Levi now at 18 months home with us, you can go to our Instagram, Korean, Korean Family Adventures, and you will be able to see our latest pictures and videos there. So today, um, the topic, it is gonna be a very heavy one. And I think out of all the videos that I have made and what I will make in the future, this is probably gonna be one of the heaviest videos. So 
you know, if you are not prepared for it, I want you to click out of here and don't watch it. But um, if you are considering adoption, I think it's an absolute must that you have to understand. You know, so many moms that I have spoken with over and over and over again, what they tell me is I feel so deceived about this whole adoption, right? And I thought, I thought about it to myself, why do these moms feel so deceived? Because nobody lied to them, right? But it's just that social media portrays adoption to be so just this heartwarming, easy, and then when you're in this reality of adoption and it is completely not what you thought, then guess what? You spiral low, you know, down low. And so, um, you know, the same thing happened to me, right? Because I was watching so many videos of these gotcha days and like social media. And what I realized, I was talking to my other adoptive mom friend and she told me what she said just totally hit home for me. She said, this adoption is not what I thought it was going to be. My child is not the child that I thought was going to be. And I am not the mom that I thought I was going to be. And what I'm trying to explain is, you know, you everyone thinks adoption is just so beautiful on the outside, but she was saying that's not the case. And she was saying the child is not the child I thought. It, it wasn't, you know, a mean comment. What she was saying is she didn't realize the trauma would come with so many behavioral and emotional issues that she could not have possibly imagined. And then um, the mom that she thought that she wasn't is, when trauma keeps hitting us, as I had mentioned secondary trauma from my previous video, it just does something to your soul and you change as a person. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And um, yeah, it's gonna be a pretty heavy one, okay? Okay, so let's um, kind of you know step back and go back to the last video. I spoke about what um, primary, and secondary adoption, right? I mean, primary and secondary trauma. So where Levi's trauma comes to me, so it becomes secondary, and then it also goes to our two kids, Seth and Ezra. And then we are completely traumatized. The secondary trauma term was, um, it, it was, it came up because these researchers were observing, uh, actually, they did not realize why all these social workers, foster parents, adoptive parents, and even psychologists and psychiatrists, right, were just so, they were showing the sign of trauma right? And they weren't sure of it. And then they found out after much observation and research that when a person is exposed constantly or just even not, it doesn't even have to be constant. It's like a huge trauma that someone else's trauma, then you get that trauma directly and um, you experience that trauma too. My, my therapist told me that do not underestimate secondary trauma because it can be as bad as primary trauma. Because many people just assume, well, he's a first, right? And then um, you're one removed trauma. But she said it doesn't really work that way and um, it is pretty serious. So this is something that I went over. And then today I want to talk about this blocked trust. By the way, about that secondary trauma where I was telling you that all these, you know, social workers and these people who were giving therapy were showing signs of trauma. 
I have a funny story about this. Actually, it's kind of sad. So my brother, he's also a physician, and when he was in medical school, he, you know, they make the they make the medical students do every two week round. I think that's what he said. Um, so two weeks pediatric, two weeks surgery, two weeks, you know, oncology. Like you just rotate, and then you decide, hey, what field am I going to go in? And he said, when he got to psychiatry. He said it was crazy because these people, right, with, uh, I get, I mean, these people, the only way that they could have turned out this way, it's because there must have been some trauma from childhood. Remember, I told you in my last video that zero to three years old, whatever happens, 80%, of it gets dumped into your adulthood. So the same documentary that I was telling you about, about regarding this, um, I think it was a group from United Kingdom where they did a research and they went to the prison and they followed, you know, they chose different inmates and they went through the history of their life. And they were reading comments, what teachers wrote, what, you know, the mom said, you know, at age 18, 15, 13, three. And what they found out was during this time, the self-control was not developed. So when the self-control is not developed and then it goes into your adulthood, it creates a lot of hot mess, okay? And, um, how do you get self-control? And the book that I told you about what happened to you, remember um, Dr. Bruce Perry, right? And Oprah Winfrey. I'm pretty sure I had read it in his book. You know, I read so many books. So, but I think um, the gist of it was when the baby's born, they don't know how to regulate themselves, like even sleep, they just don't. But when the mom is cuddling, holding, you know, nurturing this baby, they start regulating themselves. And that's a start of self-control, right? Because you can self-regulate. But if you don't have that and you are placed into orphanage or like Levi, um, when he was born, he was placed into the agency. You know, we visited our agency and upstairs they had all these beds. Like when you give you know, in a maternity wing, after you give birth, they don't put the baby right next to you. They have a baby wing, and then when you go, you have all these beds, and the babies are lying there, like, straight, and you can go and see them, or you can ask them to bring your baby into the room. So, at the agency, um, when the babies are just lying together, and there's only so many people who can work there, they can't be held, they can't be cuddled, right? How in the world, because you know what, those like two, three people who are constantly watching over a handful of babies, they're probably just busy following the schedule and feeding all of them. And what I've seen was they would place milk bottle, but these three babies, you know, they're so little, they can't like hold it. So they would put towel here and the bottle would be placed on top of the towel and then these babies are drinking it. But guess what? Like when they go like this, the milk falls, but these caretakers are so busy. And then on top of that, you know, can you imagine all these babies and then these caretakers have to change the diapers, you know, every couple minutes or hours. And so even though you grow up in an agency orphanage for just three months, right? Levi was just there only three months. But as I stated from, you know, this research that they gave, most, you know, brain connections happen from zero to three, right? And so compared to any time in your life. So even though, and Dr. Bruce Perry said, the closer it is to when you are born, when the trauma happens, it is much deeper. So, I mean, 
I guess the thing is, even though he was in this hap, uh, you know, very caring environment with caretakers at the agency, they went and it's a very warm place, right? And you could tell that these people care. You know, there has to be neglect, right? It's not um, intentional neglect, but just because lack of hands that are there to help these babies. So when the neglect happens um, and you don't get that cuddling, you know, wh where you're just heart is always placed in your, on the mom's heart, right? When you hold the baby. Um, Self-regulation is very difficult to learn and then self-control is difficult to learn. And then the byproduct of that is, I have heard that many, because of this many adoptive and foster children have um, ADHD, right? And it totally makes sense. So today I want to now go to the next step of what, the, what my post-adoption therapist have shared with me. So um, when the baby goes from primary care to primary care to primary care or growing up in the orphanage and, you know, these care homes where you're unintentionally neglected or intentionally neglected and then um, you form this thing called a blocked trust, right? You can't trust anybody. This is, she said, a very fear-based because they're not sure who they can trust. And then it's also for pure survival, right? Because if they don't take care of themselves, they feel like I can't, they can't survive. So then blocked trust happens. Now blocked trust comes with a lot of behavioral and emotional issues, okay? And I'm gonna talk about those today. And that's why I'm saying this is a very heavy topic. Now, when these behavioral and emotional issues are constantly being played out nonstop all day long in a foster care home or a, this new adoptive home, then eventually the primary caretaker, the mom, there is a burnout, right? Mom burnout. Because you know what? So many people think um, they're just babies. You know, they've been through so much. but. I want you to think that um, maybe it's not a baby, but teenager, okay? And then you have, let's say, 14, 15, 16 year old coming into your home and um, they have blocked trust and they are portraying a lot of behavioral and emotional issues. So let's say they're slamming doors, screaming at you, like cussing at you and lying, stealing, because these things like happen a lot of the times, then when you hear these stories from adoptive moms, like, what are you gonna say? Like, I don't think you would say, you know, you're so messed up, right? Because these kids have been through so much, what you can't even deal with that because people just assume, they know teenagers are very hard, right? Even a healthy teenager, right? When they hit that adolescent stage, it is rough that their hormone is just going haywire. And so, People just assume when it's toddler and baby, it's just so much easier and you're right. They look so sweet. They look so, you know, helpless. And they're like, you have no right to complain or even vent about anything because, or not even to vent or com complain. It's just like, you just need to share it, share your struggles with someone, but nobody's gonna understand except for the people that have been through this. So um, there's a childhood therapist in Korea, and if you're Korean, you would know her name. Her name is Oh Eunyoung, Park Sanim, right? And she's so famous. And she has so many um, TV shows with these therapy that she does with kids. And what she said was, Harvard did a research study and they um, observed what sound just grates on human nerve the most, okay? And it was a sound of child, toddler, crying, screaming, whining. And that just, that sound beat everything, like ambulance, fire truck, whatever it is. So when you are placed in a position where all day long, this scream, you know, shrieking, whining, crying with rage, then, it just 
really grates on your nerve and um, the byproduct of that is a burnout. Now, it's not just that, right? Because there's other areas that's stemming from all these um, childhood trauma issues. So then when the therapist told me, when she heard my whole story and how it, how I was feeling, what she said was, when you have this burnout, then you have what's called a blocked care and many um, therapists, they call it the compassion fatigue blocked care. It means these moms started out with compassionate heart and they wanted to be there for these babies, toddlers, teenagers, but when the reality from traumatic background is played out, the compassion slowly dies right? That empathy because the moms are just trying to survive, right? And so you have to understand this concept because I did not understand this concept at all until I got this professional help. So, you know, many mom, many of you are not going to be able to get this therapy because maybe your schedule is busy or maybe financially, like it's very expensive. And I'm going to tell you with post, post adoption counselors, I've called several and most of it, it's like about $120 to $140 per session. And it's about 50 minute session, right? And how are you gonna get a babysitter to go to this therapy, right? And then you're getting it once a, once a week. So imagine you're paying almost like four to $600 a month just on your therapy, right? And this one adoptive mom friend that I have, she's like, I know it's so expensive, but for if I, I don't, you know, just go and unload all this to somebody who understands like her therapist, right? She said, I feel like I'm going to go insane. And so this is why it's so important for us to have this mom support group here so that you don't go through this burnout alone. You know, when I was doing my post-adoption therapy, we were doing Zoom call. She was in New York and it was really hard. Like I would have to go into our master bedroom and I would have to lock the door. And then I'm on the Zoom call with her for like 50 minutes. But every two minutes, like knock, 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 mommy, I need this, mommy, I need that, mommy. So you are constantly being interrupted. And then on top of that, why is it doing every session of counseling that Ezra and Levi poops and I need to go and clean their poop and come out. So really your 50 minute session, gets down to like 30 minute session. And it is hard. Like people say, why don't you get professional help? And it's not that easy. Right. And, um, yeah, you say, what, what if you, what if you use health insurance? We have an awesome health insurance. Okay. But when I called all these therapists office in Atlanta, nobody wanted to no actually nobody accepted insurance that was a problem because but i understand you know we're in medical field we have a private practice and dealing with medical insurance can be so draining and so these therapists they don't have enough manpower it's just them right doing therapy and then what after home they're going to go and build these insurance so that's why even if you have insurance most you know it won't be covered i'm going to start with this locked trust I'm gonna give you an example. You know, because she says it's very fear-based, I want you to close your eyes and imagine this, okay? Let's say there is, you know, a nine-year-old boy who has no parents and he somehow gets separated and he's just placed in New York City, you know, and all around him, there's tall buildings, people he don't know people he doesn't know, and then um, a lot of homeless there, right? Let's say he's just so scared and frantic because he can't trust anybody, right? Trust. And one of the homeless guy, you know, he just strolls up to him and he, he says, hey kid, your, your, your parents are around? His parents are not around, but guess what he's gonna say? Yes, they're around. When people hear this, it's, they say, hey, like that's a lie, right? But my therapist was saying, it is not, it is untruthful, but it is because the root of it is fear because you can't trust anybody. And so that's what block trust looks like.
So one of the areas that you're going to deal with is line. Now imagine the same kid, the homeless, he, night comes and he has nowhere to go, but he has to survive. Guess what? He's going to, and days go on and he's just sleeping in the streets and he has to beg for food. Um, you know what happens? He becomes weary, not by choice, okay? Street smart. And then on top of that, he doesn't really, um, because he can't trust people, he will always constantly observe, right? Like just stare and observe people, where they're going, what are they doing, who can he, right? Who can he get, who can he grab to get some food or whatnot? And then through this street smartness, um, he becomes very manipulative. Now, it is a lot and these are a lot, actually we have been experiencing all of this in our home and I am, it is a lot so, but I wanted to go over each one and let you know that what really adoption behind the scenes look like, okay? so. Then, guess what you have? Food obsession. So, you know, many people, if you are adopting from third world country, you know, kids in the orphanage, then because they're not fed enough, the kids have food obsession. But like for Levi, he was not grown up, he did not grow up in the orphanage, right? The, adoptive mom, I mean the foster mom, gave him food and she nurtured him. But what my therapist said is, but you have to go one step backwards and go from his childhood from zero to three months when he was at the agency. And it's not like when the milk is held by the towel and it's falling and they're just moving, trying to find this bottle. You know, you, even at that age, you become food obsessed because you don't know when you're going to be fed next. Like when, what time and how long afterwards you're going to be fed again. So from then on you become, you know, have this food obsession. But she said, this is also a very control issue, right? Food obsession. So many children that are adopted before one years old really don't have food obsession. So people who adopt newborns or like a couple months into it, even six months, I've heard they've experienced you no know, food obsession. But she said, as soon as a child can start feeding themselves, right? Even though messy, um, Levi came at one and a half years and he was totally feeding himself because even at like 11 months, babies, you know, with their spoon, they try to direct it to their mouth and eat somehow. So then she said, then once they start feeding themselves, it becomes a control issue. And one of it that they see the most in adoption world is food obsession. This kid, you know, he's constantly trying to grab somebody's attention for help, money, food, or whatever, affection, whatever it is. But he doesn't know how because he's never learned how to have positive attention seeking skills, right? So then he develops this negative attention seeking. And um, again, this is very much fear-based, you know, because he can't trust anybody. Now I've talked about where he would just observe constantly and just stare at people trying to read, you know, what they're, do what they're thinking, where they're going so that he can somehow grab their attention. This is called hypervigilance, I was told. Hypervigilance. So what hypervigilance vigilance looks like is we have experienced it. It is getting better, but when if the first a year and even just up to maybe about two, three months ago, you know, they're just so hyperly just watching you all day long. Like their head is spinning, they're running, wherever you go, they're running and 
just staring, 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 and staring at you so much. Even when he was eating and I'm washing the dishes, like he would turn his face and just stare at me and he would eat. And this was happening all the time. Sometimes he would stare so hard, even when he's walking, that he would just run into the wall and he would not even realize it. And guess what? When I, um, you know, in the adoption support group, a lot of moms were talking about this, that this was happening in their homes as well. And even teenagers, they would just like just stare at them wherever they go, just for hours and hours and hours. And it is kind of unnerving when this happens, okay? Now, guess what? Because they don't trust anyone, when a kind person comes by and holds out, you know, the hand and say, hey, I'm gonna help you out. I'm gonna take care of you. Come with me, hold my hand, come with me. Guess what they're gonna do? Because they don't trust that person, they're gonna reject. So a lot of rejection is gonna come your way. And because of all of this happening, guess what you have? It is lack of, okay, lack of childlike innocence. There is no innocence there. And, you know, when adoptive moms talk about this, people just don't understand. They're like, what do you mean? He's only one and a half. He's only two. He's only three. What do you mean there's lack of childlike innocence? And it's because um, they have learned, right? These areas where it, it just developed because based out of not trusting anybody. And so, this child, lack of child innocence, um, if I wanted to explain, it's very sly, very sneaky, and they will always go around in circles. It's part of lying, but um, he will, they will already know the answer, but act like they don't know, and they'll ask you, or they don't know the answer, but they will act like they know. And um, Another area is with this lying thing, they will try to always, when they see two people close together with either husband and wife or, you know, his siblings that were there before he came, he's always trying to cause rift between those relationships. And what I'm sharing with you is not just my experience, but all these adoptive moms who came forward and you know, some of them experienced all of it. Some of them experienced more. Some of them did not um, experience some of it, but these are very much present, okay? Because he has to fend for himself, guess what? He's gonna have a lot of rage because he's never really known how to control, right, his emotions. So there is a lot of rage, screaming, shrieking, anger going on and also, somebody came and said, hey, I'm gonna help you out. But then let's say they don't or whatnot, then guess what? These kids, they get very revengeful. With negative attention seeking also comes just overall obsession. mostly with people and um, they will be very clingy, not in a good way, okay? But, um, and then also very nosy about who, when, what, why, how, where. And this constantly, they have to, this hypervigilance of, they have to know everybody, what they're doing, what they're seeing, and then they have to get into middle of those conversations and, you know, so that's also one area. Another one is always trying to get reactions out of you. You know, with Levi, we were experiencing so much of this. And even now, it's got to better for sure. But he, not only getting reaction out of me, and just trying to get reaction out of Seth, trying to get reaction out of Ezra. And when he does succeed, 
then he would just be so smug about it, you know? And I think because then you see this lack of childlike innocence, right? And it's hard to understand unless you've been through it, but you are going to see that when you adopt. Now, one of the things that happens with rage is very negative eye contact, right? You are not thinking, hey, um, I am going to look into this child's eye and just with utter kindness, compassion, you know, hey, I know you've just came to our home and you're scared, but I'm here for you. But that's not gonna happen. This kid is going to just stare at you with such anger, rage, and sometimes even hatred, right? And, and it is, it does get a little bit scary, okay? When this happens so much. Another area that you're going to see is very very, very demanding and also entitled. And when things don't go their way and they hurt someone, there is absolutely no remorse whatsoever. Why? Because they weren't taught, right? What is wrong and what is right. And so there is no remorse. And on top of that, you know, they're so full of rage rage and anger, they really just don't care. Now with this no remorse comes blaming. They will never ever say sorry. And you know, this was happening in our home all the time. He would just do really negative things and even hurt Seth and Ezra. You know, he would hit me and shriek and, but then, you say, Levi, say sorry. You know, one time it got so bad because when he gets mad about anything, he just goes into this fits of rage. And so um, he got this heavy toy and just smashed Ezra's toe. And I thought it was broken because Ezra came crying and running and his toe was so swollen, you know, it was just all black. And we actually had to take him to the image, imaging center and get an x-ray to make sure that his toe wasn't broken. But, you know, when I say that, um, but when I say that there is rage and anger, I'm not just t talking about like typical kids just playing around and pushing a little bit and, you know, just hitting lightly. It doesn't work that way. It is very, very aggressive. Now, yeah, because they've had no relationship when they see people close, you know, being in a close relationship together, there is also what? A lot of jealousy. Okay. Now, I'm sure this jealousy stems from lack of trust and also insecurity, right? So, this is also um, one, and then with this rage comes constantly physically destroying things. You will also see defiance, which we were dealing with, and even now dealing with so very much, right? And um, overreacting, right? When somebody, like, for example, if Seth was flying a paper airplane and it just touches him slightly, he will completely overreact and just shriek and scream at him for hours. And literally Seth is on his knee begging, Levi, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Because when he reacts like that, Seth automatically assumes at this age that I must have done something so, so, so bad and so, so, so wrong. And so the more Seth that begs, the more strongly he will shriek and scream. Um, I told you, they, they are constantly trying to get rise out of you. And when they do that, um, when they do that, um, and you will experience that. So Ezra is home because he went to my parents' house and he came back today. And then Seth and Levi went to David's mom's house with David today. So. 
Ezra is here with me. Ezra, you want to buy? Go get that bun. Hi, Cadell. Hi. I'm Ezra. I'm Ezra. I love you. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. For? For? Supporting? Supporting? Our family. Our family. <laughs> I need a chunu I need a chunu Now you will also see a lot of controlling behavior. Okay. Red. Oh. <coughs> I have told you about. Let's see. Also, no self control. Okay. No loyalty because he will just manipulate people to get whatever he wants and he doesn't care who he lets go lets go of and who he picks up, right? Ah, uh, it's right. No loyalty, okay? Now you will also see a lot of boundary pushing. Detachment, indifference of no matter how you've spent time with them, no matter how you've built relationship with them, there is definitely indifference. It's if they can't get stuff out of you, they don't really care for you. So indifference and detachment goes together. Okay because they're trying to survive, right? Because they don't have anything, stealing. Now, Levi is so young, so we did not really experience stealing. Um, he knows that when we go to school, when we go to store or anybody else's house, because I've taught him enough, we do not take other people's stuff. And he knows that we are always standing, you know, at the cash register paying money and he's I told you incredibly smart so he knows all this that you do not walk out the store without paying but um, about a couple weeks ago for the first time he asked me to buy him something and um, I said no and what I saw him do was he was secretly putting all these up these little pins or whatever it is into his pocket and then I was so shocked when I saw that because if I did not catch that we would have walked out of the store and I would have never caught that right so I was like Levi because I was so shocked and in the moment he saw me he got so shocked he started you know grabbing his pocket and dumping it all out on the floor because he knew he did not do the right thing like he knew because there is conscience right and so the problem is, even though there's conscience, because there's no self-control, if I want something, I'm gonna get it. It's that attitude. So when I am speaking with so many adoptive families, they have children stealing from them, stealing from their siblings and hiding it somewhere in their room, stealing from school friends. And of course there's incredible people, right? Adoptive people, we are friends with a lot of, not a lot, but we have several people in our circle and they are incredible and amazing people. And when, see you have hope because this is a blocked trust stage, right? And when you can get them to trust, each one will hopefully disappear or at least fade some, okay? So, but in the beginning, when you bring them home, you are experiencing all of this. And there's a lot more, but I'm going to end it with very selfish self-centeredness. Right? Because you can't trust anyone and you have to survive. So there's no way that you can look, you know, you can look to others. You can look to other people's needs because 
it's hard enough looking after your own need. So it, it, there, you're gonna see a lot of self-centeredness. Now, if you have RAD, which is reactive attachment disorder, you guys, this is serious stuff. Um, you, if you have any kind of inkling, then I suggest that you join this RAD group, support group. Um, there is, I think, a couple on Facebook and you can join them and this is rough because this plot trust just doesn't go away and then um, this becomes literally their character and their teenagers and they are they're not just you know living this but it becomes even more intense so you really feel for parents with rat children because I mean, these parents have poured their all into these kids where even biological children, you know, were sacrificed, right? And, but then there is no change in them and things just get worse and their life, you know, their whole entire life just passed by serving these children who just don't care. And so now because of this, I told you, that with hypervigilance, it's kind of like ADHD, right? I mean, not really, but a lot of parents do say that their children have ADHD. And when you have that, when you are dealing with kids who have um, fetal alcohol syndrome or their birth parents who did drugs, I suggest that you not only join the adoptive group, support group, but you join these specific groups, so like ADHD support group, even though they're not adoptive parents, you know, or RAD support group. And so, because even biological children can have reactive attachment disorder. And, you know, there's parents that talk about stuff like that. So you need to join these groups to understand that you're not alone. Now, when you join these groups, be careful because when you struggle and sometimes you put something out there, even in that, it is supposed to be a support group, but even in there, like some people can be very self-righteous and judgmental, which is really messed up, right? Because you go, you know, people who did not adopt or foster, they have no idea what your life is like. You know, I want to explain about this manipulative behavior, what we've experienced. And when I went to adoption seminar and these groups, so many people have said the kids act differently in front of non-family member versus family members. And this is so, so, so true for us. Anytime there's even one person who is not a family member, he completely changes. Like he becomes a sweet, um, quiet, gentle, um, charming, you know, and he would act like this, he, he has his childlike innocence, right? Which we have experienced that it's not true. And so, but then the moment that person leaves, he will completely flip and then just so much rage and aggression, right? And so people on the outside, when you say my life is so hard, they ha they just don't understand because they don't see that side. And honestly, Levi having been home with us for 18 months, he has never ever shown his true side to any of our friends. The only people that have shown his true self was our family. Now he definitely acts better in front of David and a lot of adoptive moms said the children do that. So. You know, the wives, remember, they're trying to create rift between the relationships in the house. And so the wife will tell husband, hey, I had a really hard day that he's been acting like this. And the husband just can't believe, can't understand, because when he comes home, this kid is not that bad, right? And so actually, I went to a hairdresser. I went to my hairdresser, and she, when she found out that I adopted, she was telling me about her other client that came in, and she told, she said, this lady adopted like three kids that were siblings and the oldest had major block trust and problems. And so every day he would just sit in the corner and stare at this mom wherever she went and he would say, I'm gonna kill you, I'm gonna kill you, I'm gonna kill you. And 
this mom would get so freaked out and she would tell her husband and he would not believe her because when the husband came home, this kid totally turned charming. And then so this mom had to actually videotape these incidents and show her husband and then he finally believed it. So sometimes because of this very manipulative ways, um, you may not even have your husband's support, but you know, you can't really blame him because he doesn't see what you see, right? And what Levi has sh shown his, you know, true self to my parents because when he first came, we went and lived with them for two months, right? Because of COVID breakout. And my parents, I will tell you, they have also experienced secondary trauma from him. And they are also trying their best to heal right now. But see, healing process is so hard because if these behaviors stop completely, then healing process becomes, you know, much quicker, even though it's gonna take a long time because you've experienced all this so much, you know, all day long. But when you still have this thing, just nonstop going under your roof all day long, directed against you, directed against other children at home that were there prior to adoption, then that healing process, man, you're just swimming in this survival. You know, he's trying to survive, you're trying to survive, okay? So, like literally, I feel like my head is just barely keeping up the water and then when it gets bad, I will just, you know, poke my head out and then <laughs> breathe and then I'm, you know, back into the deep waters again. And this is what most moms during this time, you're gonna feel this and be so lonely because you think you're alone, but you know what, guess what? You're not alone. You have a lot of teammates and they know exactly what you're dealing with. Now, let's talk about why so many moms say they feel so deceived with this whole thing. Sometimes it may not even have to do with social media or other YouTube families, but um, just what you thought things were gonna turn out, okay? And I will tell you what I thought. I thought we would get this child, this toddler, and that he would be very, because think about it, if I meet someone new and I'm, you know, as a child, right, then because I don't know them, I'm timid, I'm quiet, I'm shy. These, these, and because they're scared, you expect this very just heart-wrenching but pitiful cries, not this fury, anger, rage kind of cry, okay? Maybe some of you didn't think the way that I did, but this is how I thought was gonna turn out. And then, because this child is just so, you know, it, she looks so alone and he's so scared, then guess what happens? Your mother, motherly instinct just kicks in. And then you're just like, come to me, even though he rejects you. Here, let me hold you, let me love on you. Like, you don't have to be scared, we're here for you. This kind of reaction comes out, okay? But when he came home for us, Instead of being shy, instead of being quiet, instead of being timid, instead of being, you know, this childlike innocence, this was what we were met with 24 hours a day. And, you know, I read some YouTube comments where people are like, oh, you know, why is she so negative? Like, why can't she only see negative stuff? Because this is why I'm trying to tell you future adoptive parents, it is a very, very negative experience. In fact, it is so hard to see any positivity in that character during this time. And so um, you don't even know where to begin. Like, how do you handle this? Because, because you're not a therapist, right? And like, seriously, how do you handle this? Where do you even start? And so you feel so overwhelmed. Now, in the beginning, you try and try and try, and um, 
you know what, it's kind of like pouring water into a cup, except due to trauma, the bottom of the cup, cup is gone. So you just pour, 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 but it's not retaining it. It's just all going out. And, and then re you realize you just have one drop left in your cup. And even that, you know, they're demanding it out of you. And then you just flip the cup over and then you, you know, you go like this so that a drop can go to them. But guess what? It goes straight down the cup because there's no bottom, you know, attached to it. And so this is what it feels like when you're dealing with all this. I'm gonna ask you a very honest and transparent questions. question. And that is just give me yes or no answer, no buts, okay? Just yes or no answer. Are these characteristics lovable? Okay, and are these characteristics where your heart would gravitate towards too, okay? And maybe some of you will say, remember, this is yes or no, there is no but. And if someone says these are lovable and these behaviors you would gravitate towards too, I would really question if what they're saying is true or they're being honest about it. Maybe in the beginning, they call it the higher brain functioning, okay? And this is a term that I also learned, higher brain function. And what it means is when these, are, when these things are happening, you are always on alert because you, and what I mean by alert is this things ha these things happen and then, then you have to quickly um, think about what the root of the problem is, right? And then that's when the compassion kicks in. But guess what? This is what's happening in your home because one second is this, and then the next second is this, the next second is this, and the next second is this, all day long. It's like a roller coaster. It's like a hurricane in your home. And then that higher brain functioning um, power that you're supposed to have, you are so exhausted because some, you, you know, you, when you have a hard day, you just want to shut it off, okay? And then when you shut it off and you're just seeing this over and over and over again, guess what it's called? It's called a burnout, okay? And this is why so many people, as I said, feel very deceived and betrayed when it comes to adoption and foster care. And now, um, because, you know, what I'm going to do is you look at this and you're like, so Esther, like, how do we start? Like, how do we handle this? Where do we even go from here? And guess what? You know, I will continue. And guess what? Like, I have spoken with so many therapists and this is, some therapists will say completely opposite of what another therapist said. And there's, there are a lot of books out there, but some books, the way that they say handle things is completely different from another book. So you have to get, do your research and then get all this knowledge, and then you have to get to know your child and decide which method you're gonna use. And if that method doesn't work, they have, then you have to try another method, another method. And that in itself can be very exhausting, okay? Now next, I am, oh, so what I'm gonna do is I am going to make about, you know, 10 to 15 minute clip for each one um, later, maybe in a couple weeks, and just talk about what happened and how we've been handling it, what has worked for us and what has not worked for us. And so that way, if your kid has food obsession, then you can just click on that video. But then if your kid doesn't have food obsession, you don't have to watch the whole video to see, right? So that's what I'm gonna do.